Okay, today is June 17, 2016. Let us start with asking our Heavenly Family to guide us into all truth. Heavenly Family, Toda, thank you so much for everything that you have been doing. <clears throat> the plan of redemption truly is amazing. And we are so glad to be unlearning so much and to be learning so much. Thank you so much for guiding us into all truth, fulfilling your promise to us. Um, but we know that it requires cooperation in order to to be guided. So please move upon us to cooperate with you in this meeting so that it can be the best meeting that it could possibly be. Help us to um, really be able to understand the principles of investigation, the principles of truth, the principles of righteousness, Bind us all together in love. Let us speak truth together. Toda Eloheinu. Thank you so much, our Elohim, our gods. Thank you, Heavenly Family. We ask all these things, B'Shem Semach, Huahi, in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, I know that ever since the new moon where we talked about um, the various creation accounts throughout scripture that, you know, it's, it's been really changing how we look at things and that and also the authorship of the Pentateuch. There's been a lot that has gone on to change our thinking. Um, and so I understand that there may still be more things that people want to discuss in regard to those things. Also, all of this does relate back to the community rule, which we're still in the midst of investigating. And it will be good for us to continue it, whether that ends up happening tonight or you know, wherever our Heavenly Family leads with it. And then, of course, um, this Sunday is the Feast of Pentecost. So there may be comments or questions in relation to that sort of thing. So I wanted to ask, um, where are you guys at? Is there anything in particular that um, you need clarity on or that you um, feel burdened to discuss in regard to things that we have been discussing or what? Where are you guys at? Well, I have a question and it's, going to sort of be off topic, but somebody on Facebook was asking about the time of Jacob's trouble, and I wanted to know, do we have a video that I could watch tomorrow to kind of be brushed up on it so I can share some truth in regards to that with people? Excellent question. Um, I'm trying to think out of all the videos that we have, I don't think that we have a video study that goes through that in any sort of detailed fashion. The closest thing that I can think of at the present time mm -hmm. is the audio version of the two deliverances, which is that's on the YouTube channel. Um, and the two deliverances actually does address the idea of the time of Jacob's trouble very, very well. That might be the study that I would recommend above any others on that topic. Um, so even though, yeah, if you wanted to listen to that, you could, even though I know it's not the same as watching um, a live study or a study with video and everything. Um, and otherwise, you could just search for sections within the two deliverances that speak more directly to the time of trouble. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, not a problem. And of course, connected with that, there is you know a lot in the four carpenters study, but that's probably I would imagine that that would go beyond the scope of you know what you're needing it for. But I thought I would mention it anyways, just so that 
if you come to a point in the two deliverances that you need extra clarification on, it might be found in the four carpenters. Okay, that's a good place to start. It's it's a Davidian group, and they they don't accept the um, the new. I guess they call them the new codes that came out from after Brother Hodif died, and. So he's asking me, he said, okay, so tell me, when is Jacob's time of trouble? And explain this and explain that, you know. Sure. Yeah, the the two deliverances is so, so good in that regard. Um, it really, you know, for me, I used to be of the perspective, like, you know, I, I think I know what group you're referring to, and I used to basically believe that the time of trouble was at the same point that they understand it to be. And there was certain statements by Victor Hoddeff that really made me think that that was the case. And when I met Doug, that was one of the things that we talked about. And he was able to show me, hey, actually, you know what? It's not when I thought it was. And the sermons... Victor Hoddeff's sermons that were published uh, by Florence in the Symbolic Codes after Victor Hoddeff's death do go through it quite clearly, and I know that people reject it. I used to um, basically reject those Symbolic Codes as well. Um, but, you know, the branch message does show it clearly. The two deliverances has a lot that can be very helpful. Um, and then another thing that I will briefly mention is that Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, when it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble, one of the keys is just the fact that the context of it absolutely shows the time frame to which it applies. Um, and let me just see, I have some other references that I can give you that may help with that. Um, okay, yes. Uh, it's verses 7 and 8 of Jeremiah 30. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Okay, so here, notice going from verse 7 to verse 8, it's, okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, it will be so great, and, um, but he shall be saved out of it. And then verse 8 continues and explains why. It's, it's saying because or for... It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and burst the bonds. So the question is, oh wait, the deliverance of Jacob, just according to these verses, the deliverance of Jacob from the time of Jacob's trouble is from the yoke of someone. Someone's yoke was on his neck and someone had bonds on him. So the question is, okay, well, what yoke is this? Who is this talking about? And Isaiah makes it so plain. Like Isaiah chapter 10, verse um, 24 and 27, for example, it says, hold on a second here. Okay. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 24 and 27. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. Verse 27, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So that's that same language of, uh, you know, taking off the yoke and all of that sort of thing. That's in Jeremiah chapter 30. And, you know, if you look up those phrases, it's 
certainly throughout Scripture dealing with the Assyrian. Isaiah 9, verse 4. This is all in context of the Assyrian. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And of course, any Davidian will understand that verse, uh, these verses in Isaiah 9 relate to the Assyrian. Uh, just in the timely greetings, Victor Hoddeth makes that plain. So someone doesn't have to accept the new codes to get that. Um, also, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 25 it says, I will break the Assyrian in my land upon my mountains, uh, tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Isaiah 52 verses 1 to 7 also goes through this. I won't read it right now. And also Nahum uh, chapter 1 verse 13, which of course all Davidians understand that Nahum's prophecy relates to the Assyrian. And in Nahum chapter 1, verse 13, it uses that same language. Um, so that's just to say, hey, you know what? Looking at Jeremiah itself, the language it uses, and the fact that these writings which came before Jeremiah, such as Isaiah, that Jeremiah certainly was aware of and used and came in the line of, they, that same language that Jeremiah is using to refer to the adversary from whom Jacob is delivered at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, and the language that he uses to describe that adversary is absolutely descriptive of the Assyrian. And the reason why that's important for the conversation that you're dealing with is because Victor Hodaf clearly explains how the, the Assyrian period is the period prior to the setup of the kingdom in the land, and it's the period, uh, basically the, the purification of the church, the period in which that takes place, coincides with the Assyrian period. The period of Babylon the Great is after the establishment of the infant kingdom and it is um, at a point where basically, you know, God's people are already delivered from the Assyrian. So this place is, since the time of Jacob's trouble, since his deliverance, Jacob's deliverance, is from the Assyrian, well then the time of Jacob's trouble has to take place within the Assyrian period. So I just wanted to mention some of those things because... Um, in case while you're searching through the two deliverances and so on, I know that the two deliverances and the four carpenters are both very long studies, and I just thought that this might help to give you a brief thing just straight from Scripture, if not to help them at least to make it clearer in your mind. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention that may prove to be very helpful there is a file, I'm sure that if you search it in your email, you could find it, or you might have it on your computer somewhere. There's a file that I had sent out a long time ago. Um, I've sent out a couple different versions under a couple different names. The newest version is called Imperfect Statements. So if you find a file on your computer called Imperfect Statements, that is a collection of page after page after page of statements from the rod primarily, but also within the Bible and Ellen White's writings um, that show apparent discrepancies and the principles that kind of uh, work with this. And the reason why that's a, a good file to have on hand when talking to Davidians is because Davidians, such as myself in the past, uh, I was very much in the mindset where you know, I had a really hard time with Victor Hodd of having anything in his writings that was imperfect. And you know, when I would read something, 
I like there's Victor Hodif, he talks about um, the resurrection of Daniel 12 taking place in the, I believe he says it's in the sixth plague of the seven last plagues. That's what he said in Shepherd's Rod Volume 1, Shepherd, well, I think primarily Volume 2. And later in the time of the greetings, of course, he taught that it's before the close of probation. And so I, I looked at that and I had such a hard time. It's like, hey, this place, he says, it's here. And even in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2, the way that he words it at some point, I think he even says, not before the close of probation, something like that. So it seems like such a direct contradiction. And I had such a hard time with that. And so I ended up finding a way to try and harmonize the rod. And I ended up believing and promoting that basically there's going to be a special resurrection um, before the close of probation, and then there's also going to be a special resurrection after the close of probation in the sixth plague. And I had all these statements that I used to prove that, and it was really just my private interpretation based off of my meager effort to harmonize these discrepant statements. And unfortunately, as a result of me doing that supposed harmonization and promoting that, there are others who ended up taking up that teaching. And in Davidia, there are people still teaching it now. You know, so if I had just refrained from my efforts to try to harmonize and ending up privately interpreting, you know, that would be one less Davidian teaching out there. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's, it's there. Um, but I mentioned this to say it really was uh, it made a huge impact on me when I recognized, yeah, Victor Hodef did not always say everything in the perfect way. And he himself said this, but I didn't like that at the time, but he himself said this, and those sorts of statements are in that file that I'm talking about, the imperfect statements file. And he's very clear. You know, he says that not all the contents of the rod were dictated by an angel. And when he's asked about this special resurrection and his statement in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2, he said, look, the statement did not originate with the rod, so how could you hold the rod accountable for it? We were talking about something else, and we happened to incidentally mention about the, the seven last plagues and the special resurrection because we were talking about the resurrections for another point. And so we spoke of the part that God had not revealed to us just in harmony with what the church has always been teaching. You know, hey, we're Seventh-day Adventists, we're part of the church. We, we assumed that the church was right on that. And then when God showed us that, hey, we were wrong, well, we had to give up the former doctrine and go on zealously proclaiming the truth. And so there's many statements like that in that file. And... For Davidians who are in that place where they read a statement from Victor Hodef and, you know, for, for instance, in the fundamental beliefs of Davidians of the Adventists, Hodef talks about a series of events and he talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. And it looks in that place like he's placing it after the establishment of Babylon the Great. Um, it, it looks like that just in the order in which he states the beliefs. But taking it in, like, in other words, uh, a Davidian who looks at that and says, oh, well, this looks like that, and therefore Victor Hodder said it, and therefore that must be what it is. A Davidian in that mindset, some of those statements showing how, look, Victor Hodder himself said that, look, things are stated in harmony with a common idea until it is shown otherwise, and not everything in the rod is um, dictated by an angel, and he talks about Ellen White even being wrong on which day of the feast uh, the wave sheaf was offered and things like that. Um, so all of those sorts of statements and the explanations of how those principles work are all there in that file. So I think that'll be helpful. Yes, all of that is very helpful. 
you know, what I'm noticing in Davidia is that, and I've been there too, so, you know, I'm not just pointing a finger because I was there at one time too, is that we do try to harmonize all these things and we see, we see X over here and we see X over here, but they don't seem to add up. And I remember thinking, how can he do this? How can he say this and then turn around and say something different? And which one am I supposed to believe? You know, how do I harmonize to make them both correct? Um, and, of course, at that time I did not understand the importance of the spirit of prophecy among us. And that is really, I, I think that's one of the number one um, issues within Davidia that we really don't understand the importance of the living spirit of prophecy revealing to us what the truth of those statements really are. And I don't really know how to help them. You know, I keep praying and I say, Lord, I don't know what to say here. You know, if you have something, share it with me, direct me that, you know, maybe I can help someone. Amen, absolutely. And, yeah, I I really do have a heart for our Davidian friends who are in that state of mind because I was so deeply in that state of mind. Oh, yeah. And I now recognize it to be dogmatism. And I didn't recognize it as that then. I didn't understand. I was just in the state of mind. And when you're in that state of mind, it's actually very closed but you don't recognize how closed it is yes. and but you know hey our heavenly family had a way of showing me some misconceptions that totally opened the door for further investigation and coming out of that really dogmatic way of thinking and the things were the things that we've been talking about um, the quote-unquote imperfect statements through the rod message and the principles that Victor Hodov explains in regard to that, and the the truth of the living spirit of prophecy. That I mean, that's why I wrote the end of David and quiescence because, yeah, it it basically gives the answer to the Davidian dilemma. That's why Ben Roden wrote the study "Inspiration is Cure for the Davidian Dilemma." that addresses the same basic topic. Yes. Yes, well, I praise our Heavenly Family, and I just ask for prayer that, you know, somehow over the Sabbath hours I can, you know, post something to open someone's heart and mind to truth, to keep studying, keep looking, keep searching, and keep asking God. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. So I know that for some of you here on the call, if you are new to the Rod message and all of that, I can see how, um, you know, me explaining the things briefly that I did and pointing Rebecca to a couple uh, places to look, some of it may be, you know, kind of like, you know, what, well, what's that all about? You know, the Assyrian and this passage and that passage and the yoke. And, you know, if you haven't really studied those things out, I can see it being um, confusing or at least just kind of, you're kind of left in the dark. Well, what exactly was that about? But I just recommend um, a good place to start is reading the two deliverances by Doug Mitchell and then also Victor Hoddiff wrote a track called War News Forecast it's track 14 where he goes through Nam's prophecy um, that helps a whole lot because he lays out the identity of the Assyrian and also reading track 8 and 9 dealing with the kingdom that can give you a good foundation. And the timely greetings are very, very helpful because it, it really, to go through the timely greetings, if anyone here has not done that yet, 
to read through Victor Hoddle's timely greetings and study them. You know, they're small little tracks, and they really help to give a, a, a good understanding of the premillennial kingdom and the Assyrian and things like that. So I recommend that uh, for kind of like further reading for anyone who wants to find out more about the things we were just discussing. Okay, well, are there any other questions or comments? I'll mention again some of the things I mentioned um, just after we got the recording going and praying and everything. The topics that we've been discussing since the new moon, you know, relating to um, cosmology, cosmogony, what scripture teaches about creation, how it happened, when it happened, who was involved, things like that, and also the authorship of the Pentateuch. That's a connected subject that we talked about. That Those subjects are are one thing that if anyone has further questions or comments upon, we can continue to discuss that. Alternatively, we have the community rule to continue investigating. It's, I'm sure everyone by now can see that the community rule is an extremely important text. And we will definitely need to continue investigating it, whether we do that tonight or continue that tomorrow night or Pentecost or next weekend, wherever Heavenly Family needs, but or wherever they lead. But it is um, important for us to investigate that. And then also we have Pentecost this Sunday. And people may have questions about Pentecost or comments or different aspects that they've been thinking of. And um, so th- those are some suggestions. And of course, if anyone had something else, like Rebecca's question here, I think was an excellent question. I, I wanted to suggest those topics. And does anyone have any thoughts about what we should do? You know, obviously, if no one has anything to talk about in regard to the first aspects, the authorship of the Pentateuch and scriptural cosmogony, then that leaves us with either discussing Pentecost or the community rule. Well, I think that since Pentecost is Sunday, we probably need to at least um, get an idea as to how to keep it, if there's anything in particular we're supposed to do or anything like that. Wonderful. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent idea. Um, So, Heavenly Family, guide us as we discuss Pentecost a bit. There's a lot to Pentecost, and in studying the community rule over the past several months, um, I've seen that Pentecost is actually more important than we realized. And, of course, in the branch message, there's actually a lot written concerning Pentecost. Um, So in the branch message, the things written concerning Pentecost really tell us more so about the meaning of it. What's what's the idea of Pentecost? What is it about? Um, Without so much going into the details of how to actually observe the feast, who does what. The community rule with the covenant ceremony goes into some more detail as to how to actually observe it. But as we have spoken of recently, um, we won't be having a covenant ceremony this year because the community rule needs to be studied out more. But that may be the primary distinguishing thing about Pentecost, taking oaths. Uh, Shavuot, it can either mean weeks or oaths. 
And it potentially means both. It could be, from the very beginning, a double entendre. And if that's the case, then really the way that we're supposed to keep the feast of Pentecost is by taking oaths. Um, so that's, that's very important in its own right. Other than that, there are things about Pentecost that we can say general um, guidelines or rules as to how to keep it. I'll read the passage from Leviticus 23. I have a question. Okay, sure. Um, I'm really surprised that I'm not even remembering this, but wasn't it on Pentecost that um, Christ and the Holy Ghost were betrothed? Yes. So on Pentecost, they took oath. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, What Teresa is referring to, for those of you who are not aware, um, the day of Pentecost in the year 31 AD, of course we recognize that as being the time referred to in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the 120 and there was about 3,000 uh, added to them, and so on. Um, so that's typically what we think of when we think of Pentecost. Pentecost has a long history before that point. And, and of course, in Hebrew, it's called Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Oaths. And there's a lot to this. Um, Now, here's the thing. Ellen White actually talks about Pentecost 31 AD. And she she explains how on that day, that is the day that Christ was inaugurated into his mediatorial kingdom. That is when he was inaugurated as high priest in the antitypical heavenly priestly system. And he sent the Holy Spirit upon his disciples as a sign of that event in the heavens. So that that was his um, coronation day, his inauguration day, and so on. Ben Roden has some studies that, that go into this more Uh, we recommend for everyone to read the study called The Pentecost by Ben Roden. Um, Yeah, The Pentecost by Ben Roden is a very important study. It shows how, you know, Pentecost, that's the time of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. That's the time of the establishment of ancient Israel as a nation under theocracy. Pentecost is about theocracy. It's about the law. It's about (coughs) vowing, making an oath to despise the ways of wickedness, despise all that God despises, and to love all that our Heavenly Family loves. Um, There's a lot of meaning to Pentecost itself. But that's, you know, those are all things that you guys can look at in those various studies. We recommend for that, just because, you know, we won't be able within today, tomorrow, and the next day, including Pentecost itself, we won't be able to go through all there is to know about Pentecost. So it's good to know those basic things. Um, What may be beneficial for us right now is to just read the passage that speaks of Pentecost in Leviticus 23, and, you know, give some basic instruction on how to keep it, and, you know, a few passages that have something more to say on it, um, such as in Numbers 28, it talks about sacrifices for the day of Pentecost. Okay, so in Leviticus 23... 
It is verses 15 to 22. This is what it says. You must count for yourselves seven weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring the wave sheaf offering, or the wave offering sheaf. They must be complete weeks. You must count 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you must present a new grain offering to Yahweh. From the places where you live, you must bring two loaves of bread for a wave offering. They must be made from two-tenths of an ephah of fine wheat flour, baked with yeast, as first fruits to Yahweh. Along with the loaves of bread, you must also present seven flawless yearling lambs, one young bull, and two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to Yahweh, along with their grain offering and drink offerings, a gift of a soothing aroma to Yahweh. You must also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two yearling lambs for a peace offering sacrifice. And the priest is to wave them, the two lambs, along with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahweh. They will be holy to Yahweh for the priests. On this very day, you must proclaim an assembly. It is to be a holy assembly for you. You must not do any regular work. This is a perpetual statute in all the places where you live throughout your generations. When you gather in the harvest of your land, you must not completely harvest the corner of your field, and you must not gather up the gleanings of your harvest. You must leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am Yahweh, your God, or your Elohim. I've never noticed this before, but it's really standing out to me. That seemed really strange to have the not gleaning the corners of the of your field in the harvest in association with Pentecost. Yeah, very interesting how it is uh, mentioned together like that. Um, right in the middle of this chapter, talking all about the feasts. Um, yeah, so very interesting as to all the reasons why that might be the case. I don't know. I know that when it discusses the wave sheaf offering in the previous verses, it says, when you have entered the land, so on and so forth. So it gives a a context, um, which is more than just an instruction of generally how to keep the feasts. So that tells us, though, that, okay, this is a feast in which there's to be Um, a holy convocation or a holy assembly. Assembly is gathering together. That's what a convocation is. It's a gathering. So we ought to gather together for the Feast of Pentecost. If we have other present truth believers in our location, then if at all possible, we should gather together in our location. And if we don't, then, hey, we always have the community the broader community that's spread over a great distance, but we meet together on the conference calls. So if you can't get together in person, we at least do have the conference calls. Um, So that's one thing. Okay, it's a day in which there's supposed to be a gathering together. We are supposed to be worshiping our Heavenly Family. It's not a day to do regular work. It's a day to serve them. Uh, There's a sin offering that was mentioned as being offered on this day. Uh, Doug showed in the Lord's Supper from the table to the altar and back part two that sin offerings at least roughly correspond to foot washing. And so on the new moons and on the feast days, including Pentecost, there should be foot washing. Um, And, of course, there's a daily sacrifice every day, so the 39th hour 
uh, Lord's Supper occurs every day, including Pentecost. So those are some of the ways that we can keep it. It's in, in a sense, it's very similar to new moons um, in terms of how we have come accustomed to keeping it so far. But there's also a lot of difference, and we need to better understand the difference and better implement the difference in our own observance of the Feast of Pentecost. So the thing with oaths, that's one aspect that we need to look further into. Um, and also, you know, if, if that's really the emphasis of Pentecost, oaths, making oaths, entering into a covenant, then that basically uh, distinguishes it from the new moons because that isn't the point of focus on the new moons. The new moons are about the fresh revelation. So all of these, of course, are important aspects. Are there any comments or questions on any of that so far? Can we um, prepare food and do housework and water plants in the yard, things like that? Yeah, I don't know of anything that would restrict that on either Pentecost or New Moons. Um, it doesn't say no manner of work. It says no servile work or no regular work as it is in the NET. Um, so, hey, if someone was in a place where, hey, yeah, we need to cook, we need to do some cleaning, we have plants to take care of, things like that, um, I know of nothing which would declare those sorts of activities to be a violation of the Feast of Pentecost. Unless that's your job. Yeah, unless that's your job. Yeah. Right. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Um, there is something else that this reminded me of, and I actually just went and grabbed a book. Um, we won't be going through this in detail, but... There is a writing that uh, I guess you could classify it as New Testament Apocrypha. And it basically claims to be a letter from Peter to James and a record of its reception by James. In other words, uh, James receiving the letter that Peter gave and what was to be done in response to that letter. Um, there's something about this or something, there's one particular spot in this writing which really is reminiscent of this sort of oath-taking uh, type thing that you find in the community rule. And so I wanted to mention it for that reason. Uh, the document, because you know we're not going to take the time to read the whole thing, I'll just summarize the majority of it for you guys, and then we can potentially read the most relevant portion. So basically the letter is Peter writing to James and explaining how he has these books of his teaching or scrolls of his preaching and he is sending them to James but there have been so many people you know Peter saying look there's so many people who have been misinterpreting the things that I've been teaching people try to say that I am teaching things uh, teaching a lawless doctrine or they they take my teaching in such a way that makes it seem to promote uh, doing away with the law of Moses and all of that. And then they use that to promote their teaching of doing away with the law of Moses. And in this letter, Peter says that he is absolutely against such an idea, uh, that he totally believes the law of Moses, it's still relevant and all of that. And But because of this 
horrible misinterpretation of his writings and knowing that, hey, this happens to him while he's still alive. And he he mentions how, you know, people are telling him, oh, this is what you really meant. And he says, okay, so you're telling me that I know what I meant more than I know, or you know what I meant more than I know what I meant. Um, so he's kind of dealing with this whole thing. And he says, because of all this, uh, take these scrolls of my teachings and only give it to those who you have proved to be worthy, that you have tested them and proved them and shown them to be worthy to receive these things in order to avoid all this misinterpretation and abuse. And so he gives these, uh, these writings over James reads his letter and agrees that it should only be those who have proved themselves to be worthy or ready or pure to receive those teachings that would receive it. Not only that, though, it lays out a whole system where someone has to be tried and uh, proven to be uh, loyal and devoted to truth over a six-year period. At the end of the six-year period, they can receive the first scroll of the teaching of Peter. And they can only receive it if they swear an oath or take a, take a vow. And it's a very long, detailed vow that is so specific. It's kind of like, you know, in legal documents, people really try to... Um, cut out all possible loopholes or ways around it and to make it so specific so that there's no way around it. That's kind of what this uh, is like. So James recommended uh, a vow for people to take and he spoke to the elders who were there in Jerusalem with him and yeah, you know, you have this period of six years and then there's a vow and the vow is so... You know, in many ways, it's very similar to the vow that's in the community rule. And it's calling, you know, it calls curses upon oneself if one was to break the vow and to disclose the information. It talks about how the scroll, you know, if you ever go on a journey, how you cannot leave the scroll of, of the teaching of Peter in your house anywhere. You have to either take it with you and keep it on your person or you have to give it to someone for safekeeping, provided that someone has been tested by the same process and proven to be absolutely uh, trustworthy with the information. And so that, you know, it goes through all of these detailed steps and different aspects of the vow. Um, and there's a point coming closer to the end. I'm going to see if I can find it here. Hopefully it won't take long to find. Okay. Um, so this is in chapter 1, verse 2 of the reception. So it's the letter of Peter to James and its reception. So there's three chapters of the letter of Peter to James, and then there's, uh, I think, four chapters of its reception. And I'll I'll just read you this first part, and you'll see how it talks about uh, an oath. Okay, so this is the reception. Therefore, James, having read the letter, sent for the elders, and having read it to them, said, Our Peter has strictly and becomingly charged us concerning the establishment of the truth, that we should not communicate the books of his preachings, which have been sent to us, to anyone indiscriminately, but only to one who is good and religious, and who wishes to teach, and who is circumcised and faithful. And indeed, we should not commit them all to him at once, so that if he is found to lack discretion with the first, the others may not be entrusted to him. 
Therefore, let him be proved for not less than six years. And then, according to the initiation of Moses, he that is to deliver the books should bring him to a river or a fountain, which is living water, where the regeneration of the righteous takes place. Not for him to swear, for that is not lawful, but to stand by the water and vow, as we ourselves were made to do when we were regenerated to the end that we might sin no more. Hmm. Now that's interesting how here, this is a, a writing that is, you know, early New Testament Apocrypha, so to speak, potentially early Nazarene writing, um, most scholars would classify this as Jewish Christian, um, although the writers of this don't give any indication that they self-identified as Christians. They may have simply been Nazarenes. And it's interesting how here, it's talking about making this vow concerning the writings of Peter, And it likens it to the vow, at least in some regard, it likens it to a vow that someone would take right there with water. Again, this is connecting the the idea of immersion or baptism with it, ritual purity. Um, They would basically go and vow as they did when they were regenerated and they vowed to the end that they might sin no more. Well, that's what the vow of the community rule is all about. So, this seems to be pointing back to a vow that all believers would take at the time of their baptism, which is when they would enter into the community. So, you have some sort of entering into the community ceremony, and it includes not only baptism, but a vow And the vow is to the end that they might not sin. To the end that they will sin no more. Well, that's what it is in the community rule. So, I I find that very, very interesting. And just in connection with the things that we've been talking about with the community rule, and also Pentecost, and the the covenant, and the covenant ceremony and all of that, um, I thought that this was a relevant and interesting passage. So are there any questions or comments on this element? It makes sense to me because, um, you know, if someone were to get a hold of these writings and teach them, then they would, in a sense, be serving as priests. And... Our Heavenly Family doesn't want anyone serving as priests unless they have the priestly garment on. Amen. Yeah, it's uh, certainly a ritual purity issue. We need to be prepared. So, yeah, absolutely, it makes sense that... Yeah, this we know this anyways, that our Heavenly Family does not reveal everything to everyone at once. You know, they, they prepare their people to receive knowledge. Any other comments or questions, whether in regard to these particular aspects or Pentecost in general? If there aren't any other questions or comments, I, for one, would be fine with ending the meeting early tonight. Well, so to speak, early, earlier than usual. We have been on for a little bit over an hour now. And um, I myself have not had near as much sleep lately as I need, which I'm fine with continuing on, of course, if that's what our Heavenly Family brings about. Um, We do have an extra meeting this weekend than we normally do, so we will be able to discuss these things further, and we have the meeting tomorrow night as well. So if there isn't anything else, how do you guys feel about bringing the meeting to a close? I find that because I'm fairly tired myself. 
Yes, I'm good too. Okay, wonderful. Uh, would someone like to volunteer to close with prayer? I will. Dear Heavenly Family, we just thank you so much for the Sabbath. We thank you for what the Sabbath represents, the resting from self. We thank you, Sister, that you show us these truths so that they can set us free, free from sin and death. And we thank you for this weekend, this Pentecost, um, this Feast of Pentecost coming up Sunday. We ask you to prepare our hearts so that we can benefit from what we're going to be discussing to the max. And I just thank you for this fellowship and thank you that you do lead us on step by step as we're ready to understand things. I ask that you would bless us all with a good night's sleep and give us a wonderful Sabbath day. I ask these things and pray in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Good night. God's blessing. Yes. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Love you all.